As I said, they have been issued an ultimatum. Aircrafts are on standby and ready to launch an attack on all positions held by the Republic of Serbsk Army. Evo nas 11. jula 1995. godine u Srpskoj Srebrenici. Poklanjamo srpskom narodu ovaj grad. Nema potrebe da gibaš. Ni vaš muž, ni vaše braće, ni vaše komši. Je cilj furt. Pa s kim ratujemo četiri godine i jebe ima majku, ma jebe. S kim? Sve civili. Za vaš opstanak tražim da svi vaši muškarci pod oružjem predaju oružje vojsci Republike Srpske. Samo bez panike i propuste malu, djecu i ženu. Mi je svoj plan napravio dano. Ljudi idu tamo gdje je bezbjedno, to smo se da govorili. Zajedno da tu da se uvijek nekako što odnaje. Stop giving the base in an orderly fashion! What is the point of having an ultimatum if you don't deliver? Ne smijem moći mu povest moje sinove iz baze. A i da ubit će i Srbi ako i nađu. Ubit će i mene. Krimu Karmans. They are killing people outside. What difference does it make whether the Serbs kill us or you do? Over to you. Yes, Mila. Um, it's so hard to watch that. I mean, I have to say, even though I've seen it twice already, it just conjures up such emotion. Um, I think I told you the first time I watched it, I cried for 103 minutes. And I mean, I think that as a director, what you have done is extraordinary because you've managed to put together the story of those those days that shame the world and, and also have a narrative and have actors that were so powerful that they didn't have to overact. There was no exaggeration in this film because what happened was bad enough. Um, you know, you and I know each other and as my history as a reporter in Bosnia in those years marked me for the rest of my life um, as a humanitarian, as an activist, as a journalist and, and just as someone who felt unbelievably powerless as that happened, as Srebrenica happened, but also throughout the entire Bosnian war, the rape camps of Foča, the siege of Sarajevo, the sieges of Jefa, other towns, Garajde, where people were starved and killed and tortured. Um, so I wanna go back to you as a Bosnian and as a Bosnian woman, you were a teenager when the siege of Sarajevo broke, uh, came. How did you make this without um, breaking down in a sense? Because 26 years on, the horror of it does not go away. It, it never gets any easier watching this or writing about it or talking about it. And you were in the middle of it. Um, how did you do it? Uh, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to talk to you and uh, um, hopefully other people tonight. Um, look, I was 17 when um, Siege in Sarajevo started. And uh, before that, I was dreaming to become a film directress. I was telling my parents, uh, this is my job. My parents were economists and they didn't understand what I'm talking about. And, you know, there are certain subjects uh, that that um, hit me really strong during the war. One was the rape. Uh, I met some young women from Eastern Bosnia. And uh, only in 2005, I made um, a Grbavica film, which is dealing about um, rapes. 
And th this was my first uh, film. When I did first version of the script, um, I gave it to some of my professors to read. And first version was so bad, professor told me, um, you are not making document for Dan Haig. These documents already exist. You are making a movie. Movie has to take audience in. Uh, they have, you know, the movie has to um, create a world that audience would follow and feel for the characters. And, you know, that is the art of filmmaking, not smashing audience in the head saying, look what happened, even uh, if you are very angry and, and um, you know, you, you can't stand injustice. Um, I, you know, listened to this advice and I um, really changed a lot of things. And um, somehow this film about mother who is um, not saying to her daughter that she is, you know, result of the rape um, was touching people so much that I realized what is the power of art? You know, it can go into people's hearts and brain, um, very, very powerful and stay there, um, you know, just because people see the actors, they believe them, they, you know, realize this is the, this is the story based on true events. In the same way I did for Vadi Saida, I did a, a huge research, of course, as a Bosnian, you're listening to these um, stories of uh, mothers who are searching for their sons. Um, you, you know a lot. I go every year to uh, July 11 to uh, Srebrenica for commemoration. So um, I had feeling I know a lot, but only when you start digging, you realize oh, you don't know so much. A lot of Bosnians tell me now watching the film that they thought they, they know what, what, what happened, but you know, they didn't. So after huge research, then I had to say, okay, now I have to do a movie. Even if, you know, emotions are so hard as a director, you have to um, catch them and make a distance, um, but still stay in these characters, in, the, in their motivation and um, try to, to get, um, or to invite audience in. What was the hardest thing? Um, the, the hardest thing for me was to, make introduction because uh, people don't know about Srebrenica, you know, many uh, never heard of it, of Srebrenica. I was testing some um, people even when we did rough cut. Um, yeah, a lot of Europeans even don't know it. So I had a huge uh, problem how to you know, explain who is fighting whom and that this explanation is not information, but that it is um, still, you know, in the function of the film. And that took me a lot of time to write and also a lot of uh, to think how to do it. And also um, during editing, we were really trying hard how to make it um, as clear as possible so that people can enter the story. I have to unmute myself. Someone said that the phrase of the year will be you're on mute. So um, um, two points I want to pick up on. One, you talk about the power of art and all your films. I love all your films, um, Gurbavica and On the Path. They address very um, enormous issues, but you do it with great subtlety. And I also think part of this is in the casting of the actors. Can you, now I know the backstory of Aida and her and her husband, um, or actually on film, it is uh, General Mladic, right? Is her husband. Um, can you explain like they are, they are Bosnian Serbs and yet they are playing a part in a film, which the beauty of Quo Vadis Aida, I think, is that, as you said, you don't scream at us. Like this is what happened. 8,000 men and boys have died. Uh, young men were ripped from their mother's arms, mothers dressed their sons as girls to try to protect them. I mean, the horror of it, almost the facts are enough, you know? So how did you get your performances out of your actors? Because they were really extraordinary. 
Yeah, so when I'm casting, I'm, uh, you know, taking ex-Yugoslavia as one territory because uh, for most of this ex-republics, we are speaking the same language. So I'm casting whoever is the best. So for uh, my first film, main actress was Mirjana Karanovic from Serbia. And um, both actors that you mentioned, Jasna Đuricic and Boris Isakovic, they are from Novi Sad, from Serbia. They are not Bosnian Serbs, but they are from Serbia. And um, I, I, I knew them from other films. We, we worked together before. And when we started casting, uh, for me and producer, it was clear immediately that uh, Aida can be only Jasna Đuricic. It, it, she's such a powerful actress. And um, all, you know, I'm, I'm really um, admiring actors. I uh, take a lot of time to cast even the smallest uh, role. I don't think there are small roles, but let's call it for, for this purpose that way. But um, also we did uh, casting for actors Extras. This was uh, really like most of the people were really taken, um, you know, every photo was chosen for many of them. We gave, we talked to them, we gave them backstory, um, gave, made up little stories with, the, uh, you know, who uh, to, uh, created little families. And then I take a lot of time uh, with actors to um, rehearse and to put them in a situations which are similar to, to those that they are going to play. And also to, we rehearse situations which are not in the film. For example, um, Jasna and um, her family in the film, um, we had few days where they almost lived together. Um, and we, uh, in, we, had, we improvised moment when she met her husband, when she married, how they married, how they were dating, then how they married, how they got their first kid, how kids go to school. So all these things, um, they rehearsed, they improvised, they were trying out different stuff. So when the um, real story started, all actors had this backstory in their body uh, and they could really react in every moment as if they are uh, family. So with all actors, we did the same with Dutch actors, with um, uh, Mladic, with, with everybody. Uh, we did that uh, that kind of stuff. And also during readings, it's um, I always welcome their comments. You know, every actor knows the character from, from um, details, sometimes better than me who wrote it. And especially with the uh, character of Mladic, um, I talked a lot with Boris Isakovic because he's coming from a place where um, Radko Mladic is still considered hero. So we were very caref careful how to um, present this character. He is war criminal, but you know, in, for many people in Serbia, he is a hero. So we decided, you know, I was thinking how to, to uh, present him. Some, in one moment I thought, what if I just, um, you know, use this cameraman who is all, always with him um, and show Mladic only from back and never, that we never see his, his face because most of the people know how he looks like. So maybe I will not find, you know, the right actor to look like him. But I didn't want to show him from back because then I would uh, give him a um, mystery or um, I, he would be a special kind of person. I thought he is human being, he's a war criminal, but I wanted to leave him on a level of human beings. We human beings can be war criminals, can be whatever. So this is something where I want to keep in a human level. He is human being who just had enormous power over our lives and he just went uh yeah the, the way he went so i decided that he would be like um a bad director who is uh, also actor in his actions and we kept almost all of his dialogue um in a, in a way that it was almost a transcript from scenes that we all seen on YouTube, on, uh, on um, yeah, in, a, in a statements that he made. So let's touch upon something you said, um, which is about historical memory. It, in the past few years, there seems that there's almost been an attempt not to erase what happened in Srebrenica, but to rewrite the events. 
Um, we've had the Nobel Prize for Literature being given to Peter Houndke, who was a, a, a friend of, of Milosevic and also um, a known Srebrenica denying of, of the facts. Um, we've had a book called My War Criminal being written by an American academic, which basically, um, in my view, my personal view, is a love letter to Radovan Karadzic. Um, she set out to write a book about the, it's a the porn. <laughs> and along the way, she falls, she falls under his Byronic spell, as she puts it. Um, we've had people saying that the events at Srebrenica didn't happen in the way that we journalists recorded them. Um, so it's been this time of, it's now 26 years, where people are looking back and saying, this didn't happen like this, which makes your film all the more vital. Um, and I, I teach at Yale University in America, which is one of the greatest learning institutions in the world. My students are brilliant, but they haven't heard of Srebrenica. And I actually teach part of a, my, one of my classes on human rights, Srebrenica, Bosnia is used as a case study, um, along with several other conflicts about humanitarian intervention or the lack of it in, in the case of, of Bosnia. Um, so how do we keep the narrative in the public consciousness? It is so vital. Um, and yet without, I mean, you, you, you showed this film to a group of Serbian students, you said, and you were really shocked by their reaction because some of them said, we didn't learn about this. We know nothing about this. How do you hope this film will change that perception? And also what can we do looking forward to honor the memory of, of the slaughter of these men? Um, how can we keep it in the public consciousness? Um, you are completely right that uh, there is a lot of attempts to, um, you know, to, to erase what happened. Uh, Republika Srpska invested uh, millions and millions of um, dollars to uh, change the narrative, to spin the narrative and say genocide never happened. Um, they are trying that, um, you know, every day, every year, um, um, Peter Hanke was a few days ago in Republika Srpska in Serbia, awarded again the, the highest, um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the top prizes from Vucic and, and stuff like that. Um, there is really systematic work on um, denying and, and erasing. Um, how can we keep it? Uh, you, you mentioned um, my, my encounter with uh, people from Serbia and also from Republika Srpska. Uh, we decided to make a premiere of the film uh, in Potočari, in Memorial Center. Uh, and the very first uh, screening was for young people, only young people. I wanted um, to, because I'm aware that uh, film can be hostage of different politics and uh, it creates over the film that more tension and more uh, conflict can be created and I didn't want to um, allow this it's uh, my film I uh, you know I was not um, supported by my state or any political party uh, we did it absolutely independently we got money from Bosnia we got money from nine European countries but uh, you know it was five years of very hard work and it was only me and my producer who are deciding how story will look like who will play in it and where we are going to show it and how all the thing will be. So I didn't want uh, to allow anybody to grab the film and make political battle over it. So we premiered the film in Srebrenica and for young people who were born after genocide because we wanted to tell them and we had people from Serbia, from young people from Serbia, Croatia, Republika Srpska, all uh, Bosnia. It was only 100 people because of uh, Corona, otherwise we would make it uh, much bigger. 
Uh, and, you know, I told them before the film, um, you know, you are not guilty of anything. These narratives uh, shouldn't trap you. You have to know what happened. You, are, you know, you can't uh, deny it because then you are um, complicit. But you are free. You have to be emancipated for all, from old narratives. Um, who, are, who want to grab young people and keep them in status quo. Um, this for me was very important and they reacted, um, you know, first person who, who raised hand to talk because we had Q&A after was young man from Republika Srpska. He said he was crying all the time and he wished his friends who are glorifying Radko Mladic see this film to understand what they are glorifying. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, okay, this young man, 20 something, was able after 20 years of brainwashing, um, you know, in schools, in churches and media to feel something. So for me, this was the biggest award I could get that this kind of people uh, change their perspective. They, they were able to, um, to be empathic to others. They were able to understand this is not attack on them. It's a, it's a, it's, you know, story, which is the facts are checked and, you know, this is something they, um, they, they didn't know about. Yes. And also some uh, woman, one woman wrote me that she always felt there is something wrong with narrative about Srebrenica that was presented all her life. She felt something is wrong, but she didn't know what. And when she seen the film, she understood what was it. And she said she has kind of catharsic um, uh, experience with this. So I don't know how to answer your question. What can we do to keep it, um, except you know that we put it on a human level and not uh, you know th that. Numbers don't mean anything, it's just a number. But, uh, you know, for people to understand that was a um, destiny of somebody like us, you know, like you, like um, people from Poland, Germany, US, and it could happen to everybody. It's, um, you know, it's, it's such a thin line between world which looks comfortable and world that turns upside down. Yeah, I write about this a lot, the, the, how the fragility of um, when wars start and how quickly it happens. Um, you know, one minute you're doing your, your average life and then the next minute the, the bank machines go down, the banks close, there's, there's tanks on the street. And I've seen it as a conflict analyst, I've seen it over and over and over again, how, how that moment and how quickly war can descend. And wars, how they end as well are important. And I think in the case of Bosnia, the war did not end well. Um, the Dayton Peace Accords did stop the killing, which was vital, but they are, it also rewarded the, the perpetrators of these hideous crimes. Um, and the, Bosnia, the Bosniak people did not really get their fair share, both of the map and of justice, um, as we know, you know, in Bosnia, we could count on one hand the number of um, rapists from Focha that have been brought before the Hague. Um, very few. In fact, it's more the women who have been raped, and you know this, Jasmila, because we've talked about it, um, walk down the street of their villages, and they're the ones who have to drop their eyes in shame, not the men who rape them. So Bosnia, all of this, this lack of justice, um, the way the war ended, the kind of bitterness, the, 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 the increasing rise of nationalism. Um, I remember when I left Sarajevo uh, right after the war, my friends, and I go back a lot, as you know, one of my friends said, see you again in 30 years um, for another war. I mean, do you think, given what's happening now in Banja Luka and Republika Srpska and this kind of really hate rhetoric that's coming out of there, that could it ever descend into another war? I think we, when I say we, I think of all region, uh, we don't have money for new war. I, I, I just think at that time, it was still a lot of um, uh, money and facilities from uh, Yugoslavia and, and uh, Yugoslav army. I think uh, the region is economically devastated, thanks to these uh, nationalists, but I 
I hope maybe I'm wrong uh, that uh, something like that, because war is very expensive action, um, that it's not possible to happen. Um, the, people are also very tired. Like the other day, uh, Dodik said that he would call, um, you know, volunteers. And I read a lot of, um, he, he, he is able to call volunteers for war uh, whenever he wants. And I read a lot of um, uh, Serbian um, young people who say, I mean, who will come, you know, who would volunteer, who would join you? Are you mad? Um, so this is my hope that uh, it will not be possible. But um, other form of war, which is um, also very violent and it is happening through blocking um, institutions, through, uh, you know, uh, violating a lot of laws. Um, we had this situation now with COVID um, that because of this national structure that was agreed in Dayton, um, we had situation where the vaccine um, order was stopped because of nationalistic reasons. Serbia got a lot of vaccines, so all Serbians could go, you know, Bosnian Serbs could go and get vaccinated there. Um, and in, in Croatia, Croatians as well in Croatia. So uh, Bosnian Muslims were blocked, uh, you know, they, they couldn't order vaccines. So this, this kind of stuff uh, in everyday life are a total disaster for, for uh, citizens. And war, war is taking other forms, but it's still uh, conflict that goes on. And I always, um, I, I think that, you know, the, the um, how should I say, conflict is created by elites. I'm absolutely sure that if there's other kind of people in power, um, conflict would be, you know, minimalized or, or solved. I don't believe in this story of hatred as a reason of war. Now you have, for example, a um, young man from uh, Banja Luka who is a mayor and a very young 30-something um, uh, 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 mayor of Sarajevo. Two of them called each other to, you know, to invite each other and so many people welcome this gesture. One can say, okay, this boy from Banja Luka, this mayor of Banja Luka, he said also that um, genocide in Srebrenica didn't happen. But on the other hand, you know, he's the uh, young politician who will stay uh, 50 years maybe, you know, in, in next 50 years in power. And I find it great that he wants to uh, talk to mayor of Sarajevo. And I find, you know, that maybe he will not repeat these things if he understands how much it hurts other people. I, yeah, I was just going to say it because I was really shocked by his comments. I think he said um, Srebrenica didn't happen. Those numbers aren't true. And unless someone can prove it to me, I'm going to keep believing that. So I wonder how he felt after he saw your film. And I hope he saw your film. I, I, I want to tell the audience we'd love to. I see some of my old friends there. Peter Moss, Thomas Dvorak, Christopher Merrill, um, uh, Margarita Amadeo. So I hope some of you um, can have some questions and interaction with Yasmila. I'm sure she'd welcome your, your questions and your input. But I wanna ask one thing. We were chatting and you said you're going to see the Dutch journalists um, this week. Oh, no, I'm here. What was the Dutch reaction to this film? Because your, your portrayal of the commander is, is brilliant. How he first, you know, his horror that UN headquarters um, which, you know, Department of Peacekeeping at that point was run by Kofi Annan, and Kofi Annan also was head of it during the Rwandan genocide the year before, where um, one million people were slaughtered in three, three months, um, another horrifying conflict, I report it. Um, so the way he, he's desperately trying to get through to headquarters in New York, and of course the UN typically are all out to lunch or on vacation um, or on their annual leave, so no one answers the phone and the message never gets through for air support. But then his kind of complete, um, he, he basically shuts down. And that scene where Aida's knocking on the door saying, you know, Colonel, Colonel, they're killing people out there. And she says it very quietly, which is 
all the more powerful in terms of cinema. It's a very gripping moment. But you know, the Dutch entire Dutch government resigned at one point over Srebrenica. What's the reaction now when you show the film there? Is there shame? Is there how how do they respond to it? And then I'd love to get some thoughts from the audience after that. So film will start in cinema. So we don't have, um, you know, this massive reaction. Uh, we just had few festivals and film won audience awards. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people appreciate. I heard, you know, that for some uh, soldiers, it was very hard to watch. Um, you know, they, they have some justifications for Karamans, some of them not, you know, our actors who were in the film, they all said it's very important film for them. It's a trauma for Dutch people as well. And they were all very, very eager and, and proud to be part of the film. So I, I hope, uh, yeah, during cinema release, we will have more information. Yeah, it'll be interesting because of course, um, the Netherlands are having their own rise of nationalism and, and right-wing parties. Um, let's get a question. Daniel Pierce Higgins, do you want to try to answer, talk, speak live? I think I just click on this and you can, you join the conversation. Pranvera, can you help with that? Uh, yeah, I'll try just one second. If not, I can, I can always read his question. Oh, it's here. Well, uh, we've invited him to talk. He just has to unmute or we can just read the question. So it depends. Uh, oh, here we go. There he is. Hi. Good evening. Thank you very much for the film, which was moving, depressing, but very well done. Uh, the question I really pose is I, I was a criminal court judge, so I have experience of the criminal courts. I see the conviction of Belagic, what, 15 years after the event. And as we see in the end of the film, the school audience, I identified a couple of soldiers who were clearly guilty of war crimes as well, who were not convicted, who have to live with the rest of the population. And what's the significance of the court process for some and not for others? Sorry, can you just, can, can you just tell me the last part I didn't understand, sorry, or, or I didn't hear well. What is the significance of the fact that 15 years after the event, Maladjic is convicted, but yet there are a number of soldiers who clearly took part in the uh, slaughter, who we see in the school audience uh, uh, late in the film, after the event, living with, within the community. They are not convicted, Maladjic is. What, what's the significance? Is the conviction important? Is the fact they're not convicted, is that important? Look, I think it's very, very important that um, so many people got convicted, that uh, all these documents exist. I mean, I, I am so grateful that, um, you know, the uh, tribunal existed. I know how hard it was uh, to establish it, how many political um, influences were there struggling. And I am so, as a Bosnian, so grateful that exists because uh, my children hopefully will not have to explain again and again to others, you know, this is what happened. What happened during Second World War, uh, you know, many crimes that happened in Bosnia or Yugoslavia were not documented. And that is a problem now we have because uh, you know one can say you know this it was mass uh, killings and somebody will say it was not but if it's documented then you know what can we talk about of course these people who are lying they can always made up narratives but for uh, for you know new generation hopefully uh, it will be clear it will be documented and this is so so important i have i i really think it will it it changed our region completely and for these soldiers who are not, um, you know, it's pity, of course. Um, only two days ago, um, there was a case where one Bosnian um, guy from Sarajevo went to East Sarajevo and he recognized a waiter. Uh, and he, the waiter was in a film of French journalist. Um, and he, at that time, he was a soldier in um, 92. And a French journalist was filming him shooting by um, with snipers and killing person there. You know, he was with the sniper and saying, oh, I got him in his head. 
This guy is, uh, you know, later he can serve your dish in a, in a restaurant. Um, yeah, people reacted, so he will be probably um, prosecuted. But uh, of course, a lot of them are still free. A lot of them will. What is also scary for me is that uh, many of them will be uh, free in a few years. So they will be all out being, uh, you know, nice grandpas or, or citizens of, of Bosnia. This is one of, Daniel, um, as a judge, you probably know about what happened in Rwanda. Um, I think their transitional justice was handled in a much um, in a, in a much more efficient way. I mean, because there were a million people killed, they reckoned that it would take two hundred years to bring them to tribunals. Um, so they set up a system of traditional um, Rwandan justice, which was based on South African Truth and Reconciliation Committee, called Gachacha courts, um, which were really, I mean, they were flawed in many ways. There was corruption and some of the people who were convicted felt the sentences were too harsh, but they basically were this traditional African system of putting the perpetrator and the, the victim or the survivor in a field, basically, in a village field and having them recount the stories. And it's also about narrative again. So um, in a way, I think Bosnia, because all I, I've interviewed dozens of women who have been raped in, in, in the rape camps and who, you know, still see their their rapists. And I've I've interviewed people that have suffered grievous um, human rights violations and they have no no chance of getting justice. Um, which is why Jamila, you probably remember the case of when um, Natasha Kandic, the Serbian human rights activist, produced the tape of the scorpions um, of that paramilitary group that killed the men and they recorded it themselves. Um, and then Natasha Kandic brought it to light in the early 2000s. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of war criminals walking around and they probably will never be caught. And this is part of the, the, the wound of, of Bosnia. Yes. Looking at more questions. Um, um, Aeson Bulut. Mm -hmm. Vera, do you want to unmute her or? Yes, you've got a question from James Neville, if uh, she'll, uh, okay. just one second. Yep. Okay. Always a couple of seconds to unmute. Ah, hi. World. Oh, so we lost uh, Daniel. Uh, so you have a question uh, from, well, a couple of comments. Uh, and uh, so there's a question from Richard Brown. Surely the manipulation of history in the ethnic education system continues to provoke division within the Bosnian population. That's the question. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. This narratives in um, education system, in uh, media, um, through churches, mosques, it's um, working very much for the uh, politi politicians in power and uh, politicians in power definitely are not for, um, you know, uniting people because then they can't be, uh, they can't be in power anymore if they unite us, if we are, uh, you know, equal citizens, um, a lot of things will change. Do they still have the divided schools? The yes. schools going half time in Croatian, half time in, um, how, I mean, have you, have you known any children that have come out of that? And how has that been, how has that worked? Oh, um, I work a lot like I'm doing film workshops with kids because I'm interested how, how they think and I would come to uh, these kind of societies where they are divided. So I worked in stolets um, where kids have different entrances and where uh, one where school break, you know, I, I don't know how you call it, this 20 minutes between classes. Break, yeah, break. Yeah. It's uh, prolonged for Bosniak kids so that they don't meet um, Croatian kids because they will beat them, whatever. So 
uh, I was working with kids who were 12, 15, um, most of them were in, um, in, in this workshop. Uh, it took me three years to have uh, Croatian kids from that area because a priest would tell them on um, a Sunday mass that they should not hang out with Muslims. And then I was inventing every year something. What could attract them to come, you know, not to obey the priest. And finally, we've um, managed to get Dubioza Collective, one very, very popular band. And a friend of mine from Croatia also came. So I think this is why uh, Croatian kids join us. At the beginning, they were separated. They live in a very small town of 6,000 people and they never play together. They never meet each other in schools. Um, and first three days, they were very tense, standing in separate corners. And we did a lot of um, acting exercises, you know, doing stuff with them. And anyway, in this age, you are very sensitive and, and shy. But we did several um, acting games, like you have to stare in people in other person's eyes for 10 minutes. And that's very hard even for actors, and especially for kids. And after these exercises and a lot of fun and a lot of relaxation that we did, you know, and the jokes and, and you know, being anarchist, um, they, they suddenly melted and they started to be with each other, to fall in love with each other, to sit in each other's laps. It was just three days. And really, I was crying because I was thinking if they, you know, they were brainwashed for 12 years. They never heard any good word about others. And we gave them a little pillow where they were safe to be, you know, open with each other. And they, they were just amazing. They were such a, you know, they didn't care about who is what. And this is what Bosnia needs, you know, that there is a change of this toxic, uh, violent atmosphere. Well, hopefully there's going to be a kind of global reckoning about all of this. America's looking at systematic racism. Um, more and more people are standing up for Palestine after the past 11 days of, of, of absolute uh, murder there. Um, we've got a really good question from Ewan Grant and then uh, a comment from Peter Moss. But um, yeah, Ewan, we've let the UN off the hook, haven't we? Um, do you want to read your question? Friend Vera, do you want to read his question or you and you want to? Hi, Ian. Hello there, you can hear me? Hi, we can hear you, go. Yes, um, Jasmila, your point about um, youngsters staring at each other, um, you're in great company. In the books he wrote himself at his peak, Tom Clancy always used to use two phrases in every book. And one of them was, there is no substitute for looking someone in the eye. Um, I was at an event commemorating the life of Kofi Annan, the work of Kofi Annan, at the Central Hall Westminster about three years ago, pre-pandemic. Uh, Professor Mary Robertson was one of the speakers. Uh, Lord Malik Brown, it was 40 minutes, four zero minutes into the events before anybody on the panel mentioned Srebrenica. So um, if you speak to, if you look in the eyes of UN people from those days or serving now, and this of course could apply to Rwanda as well, what do you see? Have we let them off the hook? Oof, um, if I would look in their eyes before this happened, I have feeling they would be different. The thing is that they didn't look at people's eyes there. They just had, you know, whatever um, prejudice of, you know, not observing them as a human beings. And this is what we need, you know, that others are human beings. Everybody is human being and we should, you know, 
do for them as we do for us. Of course, I'm saying something that is too idealistic. But um, looking them in the eyes now, I, I talk to many uh, Dutch soldiers who have very big um, post-traumatic syndrome. They uh, know that this was wrong, what happened. Uh, many of them were 18 year olds who didn't have power to change something, um, unfortunately, and they really suffer. I met a lot of them who are not able to function in a, in a Dutch society, they are, you know, with heavy alcoholism and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, they know that they did uh, something wrong. I wish we don't have to correct it after. Let's see how we can uh, prevent it, how we can take care of others. And for me, the one thing which is um, clear also now, you know, about Palestine and Israel, it's about elites. Elites are, you know, making conflicts to keep their own power, to keep, to, to save their ass. And if this narrative is there, you know, it's not about Israel and, and, and Palestine. It's, you know, about these assholes who want to keep power and don't, they don't care that kids are dead, you know, in order to stay in power. If we change this for me it was very important never to say okay you know serbs committed genocide no it is radko mladic it was you know Bek karadzic it was you know milosevic and my serbian friends like natasha kandic that the janine mentioned uh you know women in black they didn't commit they are serbians they didn't commit genocide you know they were fighting against the uh, serbian politics in in the 90s so these kind of narratives, you know, from journalists to artists, it, it has to change that we understand, you know, it's about elites. You know, I, I would never blame the young Dutch soldiers who were there because as we see in your film, they were so outnumbered and they were terrified and they were kids. Um, there's a, a young female soldier who's in your film and, and you see her kind of horror as it, it's building up. But I do blame, UN headquarters. I do blame General Jean, Jean Vier, and I do blame Kofi Annan, the late Kofi Annan. I know we're not allowed to say it because he's a kind of hollowed figure, but I think that they um, they should have acted in the same way that the war in Syria could have been halted very early on in 2013 after the chemical um, attacks had there been some strategic humanitarian intervention. So, I mean, there, there, there are times when you do need to lay blame at the feet of people. Otherwise, you know, why did, how many people are dead in, in Bosnia from a three and a half year war? You know, a half a million people dead, 8,000 in, in three days. So I think we do need to have a reckoning of looking back historically and to see where the UN failed. Um, I, I can't even remember if Kofi Annan actually did apologize. I think he did, but in a kind of like tepid way. Um, Anyway, Jenny, if, I, if I can say something, I'm, you know, I'm thinking if if Srebrenica is happening at this moment, um, you know, th th that we are talking and that uh, the same situation is now there, I have feeling it would be the same outcome. I don't see politicians in Europe uh, who would, you know, who would stop it, who would uh, put their neck for Bosnian Muslims. I really don't see it. I mean, maybe Biden would, but um, Biden in, in Europe, Biden or, or wouldn't, I don't know. Gaza. But for me, this is, a, this, is a, um, this is scary that um, we still live in a situation where UN is blocked by uh, political interest and not human rights. Um, you know, it, it, the, 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 um, yeah, politicians can block it. UN and uh, UN is not still not able to be independent. And I wish UN is independent and powerful. We're gonna to go to a question by Alexander Stewart, but I just wanna raise one point to your point, Jasmila, when there is political will, it can be done or when there is the will on the ground. And I, oh, I teach another uh, case study to my Yale students and that's Sierra Leone 2000. And some of you in the audience may remember what happened there. It was one of the most horrific wars I've reported. A small group of British special forces landed there with the intention to evacuate British civilians. And they were led by General Sir David Richards, who then became head of the British land forces. But at that point, he was a brigadier. He saw the civilians 
about to be slaughtered. And with his small group of rapid reaction force, essentially, and it's long and involved, and I've written about it extensively, they ended the war. They pushed back the RUF rebels. They protected the civilians. And this was because purely he saw himself as a soldier and his role was to protect the people. So, you know, I think there's all kinds of excuses made for the UN and I don't think we should let them off the hook on this, on Srebrenica, on Rwanda, on many, many, many events where they have failed. And that failure was the cost of human life. So, sorry, it gets me so angry talking about that, but Alexander, um, you've got a really good question as well. We're trying to unmute Alexander. Uh, let's see. I'll read out his question. Uh, why do you think that Western Europe seems to have so little interest in the events of that time? Because uh, perhaps because it was it stirs up memories of 1939-45 and uh, matters that we would prefer to forget. Yeah, I don't know really why it was so far away. I know that um, um, it's still somehow we are something else. We are not Europeans. We are uh, like, I, I remember there was um, European Film Academy and they were saying how wonderful Europe is, you know, for 70 years, we didn't have any war, nobody was killed. And I was in the audience and I was thinking, I mean, presidents of European Film Academy didn't hear that 100,000 people got killed and, uh, you know, 2 million expelled in, you know, just at that time, it was just 20 years ago. And I came to um, this president and uh, she said, uh, yeah, 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 oh, yes, but you know, that's the other. We are others, we are not considered uh, Europeans. I don't know why, is it because of socialism? Is it because of Second World War? Is it because uh, we are Muslims, ma majority in Bosnia? I, I don't know why. I was working for the Sunday Times at the time, and, and I, I can tell you that it was a real fight to get my stories in every week against Princess Diana. You know, and, and you have to also think about the, what the general public wanted to, to read about. Um, so, I mean, there was, there, there wasn't, you know, we, those of us that really fought to keep Bosnia in the news, it was really a struggle. I mean, there were papers like the independent that were great and the guardian, of course, but, um, you know, the times, the, the Sunday times, it was really, really difficult to keep the public attention on that. Um, there's another question from Vera. Do you want to read it? It's, uh, from uh, Marcus, Marcus. Yeah, Mike, Marcus Relton asks, um, how did Jasmila go from Hassan Nuhanovic, the interpreter to the Dutch UN troops personal story to Aida's character and story as a way to dramatize the events at Srebrenica in July, 1995? Yes, yeah, so I uh, started with Hassan and it was very difficult for him to have story which was based on his family. Um, he was um, helping me a lot with all details, with um, you know questions that were in his book and, and which were not in his book uh, that I had. Um, and he really gave me inside information about each detail. Um, but in one moment, um, he couldn't understand that this is not a documentary film. Um, so he insisted on some things which don't work in a film language. So so we decided to, you know, separate and I um, wrote the story uh, of Aida uh, because we had contract where I said I will change names and everything which was, uh, which was fine. And I um, decided to talk from a female perspective because I thought it will be easier. At the beginning, I said how difficult it was to get audience in the film because um, of the same reasons we talked now we are the others and you know it, this is a conflict which is not so known it's not in the conscious of people so i thought through a um, character of a mother uh, who wants to rescue her family everybody in the world will understand uh, what is the struggle and that's when i you know uh, developed the script in um, aida's story um 
we only have a few minutes left. I don't know if there's any more questions, but I just wanted to finish off by, um, first of all, thanking you for the power of art, um, Jasmina. You know, you, you spoke about the power of art earlier and it is, it is, it is factual, but it is a film. And I think the, the, the fact that she's a mother, Aida desperately trying to save her, her sons and keep her family together resonates on so many levels. Um, and I think that's why it's very, so painful to watch. Um, I wanna ask you about your next project, um, what you're doing next. And then I think we have to wrap up, but um, yeah, tell us what you're up to now. Yes, before that, I would just like really to thank you and probably many people who were um, in Bosnia who are on this panel, because Sarajevo, where I lived during the war, I have feeling we would have the same destiny if it wasn't for you journalists. Um, the fact that there were not journalists in Srebrenica, I think, allowed these, you know, monsters to do whatever they wanted in Sarajevo, uh, though they did a lot of killings and stuff. Um, they, I, I feeling that this was, this saved our uh, lives. In a, so I want to thank you all. But uh, regarding the, the, the uh, new project, I have uh, idea to make um, maybe TV series, maybe film about the siege of Sarajevo. Um, at the moment, at the moment, um, I have to take a little break uh, from war things and, you know, just um, psychologically to, to go a little bit out of this, because whenever I think about it, I go, you know, back to many memories that are very difficult, also very uh, beautiful. There, are, there were many beautiful things at that time, and I would like to show this uh, contrast because this is what life in Sarajevo was a lot of painful and a lot of uh, beautiful things uh, so I would like to do that in a, in a couple of years until uh, then I would uh, try some different stuff I'm talking to HBO about uh, one TV series and um, I would maybe try something completely silly just to get out of this in order to come back Jasmila, thank you so much for meeting with me today and with everyone. And I hope soon we're going to have a non-Zoom world where we can all meet together, yes. actually sit down and do this, do this in a, in a different way. And thank you, thank you, thank you for making this extraordinary film, which will haunt me for the rest of my life and, and many others. Um, we're deeply grateful to you for honoring the memory of, of, of the dead. So Thanks, Pramvera. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and if you haven't seen Quo Vadis, please go watch it. It's, uh, but make sure you've got a huge stack of Kleenex next to you. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Janine, so much, and Frontline Club. Thanks a lot. Thank you both, Yasmila, and thank you, Janine. And so, just to remind everybody, next week we're taking a, a week off because we have. Uh, it's just for personal reasons, but uh, we the topics that we are exploring perhaps next month is we're going back to Rwanda with Michaela Rong and um, Lindsay Hilsom and other speakers. And um, also we're revisiting Afghanistan as a story we want to follow until September with a series of events to see how the withdrawal everything's happening so please do join us every week and keep an eye on the on the listings and hope to see you very soon ladies thank you so 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 much <laughs>